So, we're here to um, we're here to size a pump. What pump do you want to size? I have a I have an idea, but I'm uh, I'm willing to be flexible. The hardest one. They all have their little tricks, I think. They all have their little tricks. How about if we start with like an intermediate one? That sound fair? I was thinking of the diesel B storage tank because I sat down on my desk and did the first little bit of it myself just a minute ago. And it's a good one actually because it's got some little tricks in there that I think you'll find kind of interesting. And we might even have to deviate from my method a little bit, which is I think a good thing. Learn a few new things about it. So if we're going to do that, let's start, whoops, Daisy. Okay, there we go. Uh, let's kind of start with the method and follow it as best we can here. First thing we need to do is, is to draw a diagram. And I don't have the P and IDs, so I'm going to try and make this up a little, I'm going to have to make this up uh, as I go along a little bit. I guess I could have grabbed our masters, but. Okay, so here's the model here. And our diesel uh, pump here, let me just zoom out a little bit. Make this bigger. Okay. There, that should get everything on there. Uh, it's still a little hard to see. But essentially what we're doing is we're going to grab just the diesel here. Zoom in a little bit more. Oh, where's my mouse? There we go. That's what I need. That's what I need. Okay. Okay, so there's the diesel pump there. <laughs> Comes down here, joins with uh, fluid from the diesel hydrocrack, from the, from the hydrocracker here. Uh, goes through a cooler and then goes to one of two places, either, either the diesel B tank or the diesel A tank. So I think that one looks like a pretty good, reasonably complex one. Uh, and it's coming from the, uh, from the tank here. So uh, the first thing you want to do is start with a diagram. And so let's draw the column itself. Hopefully we've got enough space to do this. We may have to go on to two white whiteboards here. Okay, so there's the column. Um, let's draw a ground level here. And we'll put the pump on ground level here. We come off the column at some point here with a side draw. And it's going to follow the column down and go into the pump there. The next thing is we've got the um, uh, you may have put a control valve here to try and control the flow rate coming off the column, but that would have been a bad idea because it's on the pump suction. So the next thing you might have done is put a control valve here and you might have made it a flow control system like this. I'll just draw it in a, in a sort of simple, simplified version. The next thing we've got is we've got flow coming in from the hydrocracker. So that's a little bit different than some of the pump uh, examples we've had before, but that's okay. So we'll show our flow coming in from the hydrocracker here. I uh, don't know exactly where that's coming from, so I'll just kind of show it like that for, for now. And then we're going to have to go through a cooler. Uh, get rid of some heat there. And then we have a choice of going to the diesel A or the diesel B tank. So let's draw um, the A tank here. and the B tank here. They're both going to be at ground level. <coughs> so let's just kind of put a hash mark to show that it's at ground. And the diesel B tank here. Okay. They're both going to have a maximum liquid level in there. And we need to be able to go to both of those tanks. So we're going to do that. And we're going to do that. And in order to get the right recipe for the diesel A tank, 
you might have been inclined to put some sort of a flow control loop here. And you might have um, tried to put some sort of a flow control system in here, like that, just to sort of balance those flows out. And in fact, we would have the kerosene coming in here as well, right? And it probably has some sort of a flow control system on it like this. Anybody see any problems yet? That should stand out like a sore thumb. What's that again? It is dueling control. Where's the dueling control? These are the, these are the things that are dueling? Kind of, but not really. They're, those two really aren't dueling by themselves. Yeah, this, this is somehow dueling. You really can't control all three of those. So you've got a choice. You can either get rid of that and put it down here, or get rid of that and control the total flow. Uh, if this is on some sort of level control system here, it depends on how we're actually going to control that control valve. Um, whoops. Let's, um, maybe the best thing to do is just assume that we're going to take, get rid of that one. We could try it both ways. Let's get rid of this one first on the first go. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just have to go back and redo the calculations. Now we've got uh, a little bit of a diagram. We, uh, we have some elevations in here that we're going to have to sort out. Um, just some rules of thumb here. We probably, um, the bottom tray here, I think, uh, to the bottom of the column, that's about six feet. We don't really know how far the top of the, t the bottom of the tower is off the ground. Uh, and we can change that if we need to. So for now, let's just call it uh, six feet as an approximation. And then we have right up to the top of the tower here um, with some packing and some side draws in here. One thing we do know is we need to start finding where these pressure nodes are. So we know we have a pressure transmitter up here. So we've got a pressure node there. Uh, the tanks are essentially atmospheric uh, storage tanks. So uh, these pressures are known up here as being uh, atmospheric. Like that. So that was, that was easy to kind of know where the, where the pressure nodes are. If you've got your equipment list, then you probably know how tall this tower is. I don't off the top of my head, but we can, I, I can estimate some of these numbers uh, for this exercise, but I think you guys should use your own, <coughs> your own numbers for that. We don't know what the line links are, but we'll get there in a second. Okay, so... Um, the next thing we probably need to do is just get a sense of what our flow rates are. So coming off the tower, um, coming off the tower, uh, let's go to conditions. I think we can read the flow rates pretty much directly. Whoops, properties, I mean. So we scroll down here. So Heises tells us that the flow rate coming off here 
is about 6 US GPM, 5.954, so we'll just round it to 6. Cause from the hydrocracker, we have a small number. And that is, where is it now? Scroll right by it. Da, 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 da. Sponsor. Ah, there it is. 1.2 gallons per minute. These are really small flow rates. This is less than your shower puts out. And we actually have some kerosene that's going to be mixing in there as well. And that flow rate may be a little bit uh, variable depending upon um, that's a small number too. Zero quarter of a gallon a minute. Zero point three gallons per minute. Okay. Now oh, these flow rates are small. So if we want to know what the flow rate through the pump is, we want to take into account uh, our 20% um, increase right off the bat. Let's see here. Okay. Let's scroll down here and follow the instructions a little bit. So our normal flow is about 6 US GPM. We want to multiply that 1.2, and then it reminds us that if we need a minimum flow bypass, and we do because that flow control, uh, level control system could force that valve closed. So we better put our minimum flow bypass on there. Like that. Put it back into the tower. Like that. So step two, flow rate. Um, pump. Uh, so the process is 6 US GPM times 1.2 and then divide it by 0 0.85 giving us whatever that works out to be. Eight and a half, eight point four seven. So the pump's got to put eight point four US GPM, but as soon as we join in the hydrocracker, um, we've got to put a little bit more into there. So that's going to be one point two times one point two. So one point four four. So this is normal. So from this point onwards, we're flowing at 1.44 plus uh, 8.47. Yellow, if, I, if you guys see a mistake that I'm making here, okay? So the flow here is 9.91, pretty darn close to 10 GPM. And depending upon whether we're making diesel A or diesel B or, or, what, or maybe we're splitting it, I think we'll probably want to have the worst case. So we'd assume that we're carrying uh, 10 GPM essentially all the, all the way to the diesel B at some point in the year and trying to take a, um, would we do all of that to the diesel A? We might end up taking it all to the diesel A. Oh, there's also the off-spec tank too, right? Forgot about the off-spec tank. That's pretty much going to be the same as the diesel B. That's just going to be an on off valve like that. So 
So let's assume we're going to take uh, 10 gallons a minute uh, to all of these. That 0.3 uh, would make that a little bit higher than that. And we could be diverting more of the kerosene. So from this point onwards, we have to check to see how much kerosene we actually can put in there. And we really should be check I should be checking the recipe too, but uh, I don't want to take the time to do it, if you guys don't mind. But the, diesel, the kerosene tank is putting, potentially we're putting, gas flow, 4.15. So we could be putting up to about four and a half. If we're trying to make as much winter diesel as we possibly could. So that would make this flow rate around 15. Um, that's going to make it interesting. OK. Four, four, four point five here. Here, uh -huh. we've got about ten gallons a minute that we could potentially bring in from the uh, diesel. That's not going to be the right recipe, I know. Um, but if we did add them two together, then we'd have fifteen US GPM. Yep. Total. Can't be worse than that anyway. Can only be less than that. Um, oh, I forgot to rate that up by the one point two. Sugar. 5.4, okay, 5.4, so we're still about 15, 16 gallons a minute. Okay, so now I get a good sense of the flow rates. Any questions? Did I make any mistakes, you guys? Think it's all right so far? Yell at me if you see anything that looks crazy. I have not done this. I haven't done this in a year, so I'm probably pretty rusty. Okay, so now we need to uh, determine the inlet pressure to the pump, and we can do kind of a simple version, and we can do a tough version. The simple version is um, try and figure out what the pressure node, uh, get the pressure node up here, and uh, figure out what the pressure is essentially at the inlet to the piping system. And then we'll make this huge, crazy assumption that says that if we gain any static head here from going down, we're going to lose it all in piping frictional losses. So that would be kind of a worst case. That would be almost like a minimum um, uh, suction pressure, which is not a bad idea to, to, to do that calculation. A little bit more complicated version of that would be to actually do, um, to actually calculate how much pressure we would gain from that static head and do a little frictional loss calculation uh, to subtract the frictional losses in that piping system. So if we're going to do the NPSH calculation, we actually have to do that. So let's take a stab at this. Uh, if we go to the model, we need to know what the, uh, what the pressure node is operating at. So that's the tower. And we've converged our model at 16.7 PSIA. So we know the pressure at the top of the tower is 16.7 PSIA. So that's our source pressure. So we're going to write that down. P source equals 16.7 PSIA. And we can't just use um, the height of liquid there because essentially that tower is almost empty of, uh, of liquid. So what we really need is we need the packing uh, pressure drop through that system. Now we actually have, let's see, we have one draw for the ker kerosene here. So we've got one section here. And then we have another section here. And then we have another section essentially here. What we need is um, we need to know where that draw is. And we need to calculate the pressure drop through the tower 
down to that point. Luckily, the uh, tray utility that's built in HISIS does a pretty good job of calculating pressure drops through the, uh, uh, through the packings. And so all we really need to do is we need to know where the draw is. And we can scroll down here. And we can see that the draw is on tray 17. You can see that it's right there. So what we need to do is we need to go to the, into the tray sizing utility in this case and get it to calculate. Uh, so I'm going to delete that and just add it in again. OK, so I'm going to add a utility. Whoops, not the other core. Pardon me. Get rid of that. Okay, tray sizing. OK, we need to select a tray section here, which is going to be our distillation column like that, and we need to add a section. Yeah, we know that. Okay, so it's going to be uh, packed. I'm actually going to uh, auto section it for fun. One inch ballast rings, that seems like a good choice, maybe from what uh, we could use structured packing. Uh, let's just leave it at ballast rings just for now. We can, I can always go back and change it later. Okay, complete the auto section. So it actually wants to split this up uh, from 1 to 27, and then it wants to do, I guess, probably the feed tray or where the steam tray is on uh, steam injection. No, it's probably the feed tray 28. I'm just going to flip that around a little bit, and I'm going to go down to tray seven, uh, 17. And then what I, could, what I could do is just add another section so that it actually would leave the tray sections the way it is. And Okay, so now we should be able to go to the packing here. And it's telling me my section delta P is 0.24 PSI. So if it's done the pressure drop calculations, we now know um, we've got a pressure up there. We've got the pressure of the pack bed, 0.24, so that gives us New section equals 16.7 plus 0 0.24 PSI. Now what we've got is uh, from that column, or sorry, from that tray, uh, from that elevation down here, we need to know what the elevation, uh, well, okay, we could stop here. Yeah, there's two ways to do this, right? So we could stop right there and say, okay, our minimum pressure is going to be 16.7 plus 0.24. So that's about 16.9 PSIA. Just for fun, I'm actually going to calculate the, um, the rest of the static head, and I'm going to try and subtract the frictional losses. So this is version 1. Version 2, so same thing, plus we need some elevation, so uh, let's see, we've got that second, uh, from that bottom section down, it looks like it says it's 20 feet plus another 1.7. So we've got about 22, about 22 feet uh, of elevation here. Plus, I think, do we have another draw in there? No. But we are bringing the feed in, so we probably need a couple of feet for the feed. Then we've got six feet for the kind of the reblower and another six feet there. So what does that run up to? 20, it's 2, it's 12. OK, so we've got 36 feet. Again, if you guys see any mistakes here, yell at me. 
Okay, we need to uh, convert that 36 feet of fluid into a differential pressure. So I'm going to multiply it by my magic constant, which is 0 0.043352 uh, times the specific gravity of the fluid. And that I can just grab right off the pump, right off the simulator. Mass density is 6, specific gravity is 0.605. I'll just write conversion. 0 0.605, specific gravity, that makes it clear, a little bit more clear for everybody. So that's the, um, that's the pressure, oh, I'm an idiot. This is a pressure drop here, you guys, not a pressure addition. No, it is, it's right. Okay, Getting, I'm confusing myself. Okay, that's good. Uh, so we're gonna gain pressure and then once we get to here, now we have a liquid filled line, so we're gonna gain all the static head here, which is there. Now what we need to do is compensate for the frictional losses. We need to know how long that line is. Actually, let's do the math on this one, just to get it out of the way. So this adds up to about 9.4 PSI, like that. And now we need some frictional losses. Hey. Yep. Sorry, yep. Can you go back to the, the pressure's in the column? The pressure's in the column, yeah. Sure. You're right. Thank you. Yep, you're right on. Yep, thanks. Okay, let's fix that. Yep. Okay. So any other problems, you guys? 25.2 as a minimum pressure. This is the minimum pressure. Thanks for catching that. And okay, so now we need to get a sense of what our frictional line losses are gonna be. We know We know we have at least 36 feet of piping, and then the uh, pump is offset from the column a little bit. Probably another uh, 10 or 15 or 20 feet, plus it's gonna wind around a little bit. So there's probably a good 60 feet of piping, I would guess there. So we could guesstimate it if we didn't have a, a, a decent model, but we do have a good model. So we can pull this up and we can look for the pumps here. So there are the diesel pumps right there. There's our column right there. And let's just move the whole thing around here a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna have to come off the, uh, uh, the tower towards the bottom, so somewhere along here. We're gonna have to wind along, uh, get into the pipe ridge, come along the pipe ridge here, and uh, we've gotta get to, yeah, these pumps here. Okay, so we've gotta come along here, then we gotta drop down and go into the pumps here. So, there's a couple different ways to do that. We can just measure it fairly quickly with one of the measuring tools. And that would be where, tape measure here. See if we can get a little bit of a sense of it from the tape measure. Let me get a little dodgy here. Looks like we have about 38 feet there. So who's writing this down for me? 38 feet. That's assuming I've got the right level. 
And we're going to have to come all the way pretty much to about there. So there's about 70 feet there. <coughs> we're going to have to go down pretty much to ground level. There. 17, <coughs> it's about 17 feet down. <coughs> and from there, there, it looks like about another 16 feet. Okay, so ballpark, our frictional losses are at least 141 feet there. Plus, I really need to uh, show the fact that I'm splitting between the pumps, so I better add another 20 feet for that. So let's call it 161 feet of piping. That's not counting elbows. If we want to, we can count the elbows up because we've got such a good model here. I think what I'll do is instead of counting the elbows, I'll use my uh, times four multiplier. Factor for elbows and valves, et cetera. Han, han, uh, these are manual valves. Okay. Now what I need is essentially the pressure drop uh, per linear foot of piping. So we've got six US GPM. If it was water, we could just kind of go to the crane manual here. Let's try to zoom in on this a little bit easily. I'm going to zoom in right for you guys. There we go. OK, so here's uh, six gallons per, per minute right here. Uh, we go zipping across here and have a look at the velocity. Velocity there is uh, half a foot per second. That's pretty small, or pretty low. Um, Let's go and see a little smaller line size. Six, three quarter inch line would be 3.6. We're, we're aiming kind of for a pump suction to be around um, three to five feet per second. So somewhere in there, three quarter inch to one inch line, super small stuff here. Um, we're also looking for a fairly low pressure drop in terms of PSI per 100 feet. So there's one PSI per 100 <coughs> feet with a one inch line. Maybe we should do it uh, with a, we'll try it with a one inch line initially. Yeah, let's do it with a one inch line. Okay, so a one inch line is about 1.2 PSI per 100 feet. feet. And that's from the Crane uh, technical paper 410 uh, for water. Now what we might want to do is we want to say how realistic is it that we're actually using water. What we need to know is we need to know the, uh, the viscosity of the fluid. And luckily, uh, Isis can tell us what the viscosity is. There you go. Viscosity is 0.3, so it's less than water, which is good. Um, so we can probably use the water tables, and we're conservative in terms of the, uh, the pressure drop. We're going to overpredict the pressure drop a little bit. 
Uh, if we want to, we could throw a pipe segment into, um, into HISIS and maybe do a little calculation, just check what the pressure drop is per 100 feet. So for now, let's, let's, let's leave it at the crane paper because we're, um, we're, not, we're not in too bad a shape. So that means that we have about 7 PSI, 7.7 .7 of frictional losses. And you can see my assumption that I said the static head is equal to the frictional losses was the same. Well, they're not the same, but it's not far off. So we can then basically sub that in, and we can calculate what our suction pressure is. Five, 26.98. So now we might as well just label that. Anybody see any other mistakes? Okay. Now we need just the discharge pressure. Basically, it's the same procedure, really. Let's go back to my. Let's go back to the wiki. Just make sure we're not missing anything here. Okay, so we got our, six, uh, our uh, inlet pressure. Now we need our pump discharge pressure. So we're looking downstream for all the pressure nodes. It happens that we're basically all going to um, uh, atmospheric storage tanks, so that makes life pretty easy. Um, pump discharge pressure. So P destination. Is equal to zero PSIG. Now that's not exactly correct because the way the conservation vents are set up, um, that pressure in that tank could rise a little bit. Um, it could rise to essentially about a hundred percent over the set pressure of the conservation vent. Um, but those conservation vents are probably set at something like two and a half inches water, so uh, it's way down in the decimal places. So I'm just going to say it's zero PSIG, but I know it's, it's not quite right. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is work backwards to the downstream pressure to determine the pump discharge. Um, we need to include uh, all the equipment, the control valves, the piping, all this good stuff. Let's start with, uh, let's say, the elevation. Okay, here's where I need your help, you guys. I don't know how big our tanks are. I need the height of the liquid level in our tanks. Anybody got a sense of how big your, your storage tanks are in terms of height? Anybody? Should we just make it 30 feet tall? Should we just make an assumption for now? You, can, you guys can look it up. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's call it 30 feet for now. And you guys can go back and check it. So we've got to be able to pump right up to the maximum liquid level in the, uh, in the tank. So the delta P uh, static equal to uh, 30 feet times 0.43352 times the specific gravity of that fluid. Now, because we've brought uh, the temperature down here, that means that the uh, specific gravity of the fluid might be a little bit different. We better just check that, make sure we're calculating it right. Whoops. Okay, 
there's the diesel A, there's the diesel B. And the last density is 799. Yes, so it actually has gone up um, times 0 0.8 specific gravity. So specific gravity of the oil right here. So from here on, um, the specific gravity is equal to uh, 0 0.8. There, there it is right there. There's 800 kilograms per cubic meter. So water is about 1,000. So about 10.4 PSI of static head right off the bat. We're going to have some frictional losses through here. We have that um, heat exchanger. Did we do that? We did that as a quick size, probably, didn't we? Okay, so if it's quick sized, then we're going to assume the delta P is 10 psi. We got to get the line losses. We got to get the line losses in there. I guess what we're doing really is we're just. Um, we may have to split this up into a couple of different destinations because of the control valves that are in there. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to do this as two different destinations. So this is going to be destination diesel B. Back in here, um, we know the flow element is usually around 3 psi. That's 100 inches water, which is where they typically range um, a differential, a, a, a restriction orifice for a flow meter. Uh, if it's a different type of flow meter, it may have a slightly different pressure drop. The uh, control valve here, we have a couple different ways to size that control valve. We can use uh, the rule of thumb of 10 or 15 PSI across it. We can use Connell's method, or we could use the, our, our fancy new spreadsheet. For now, I think I just want to use 10 PSI just to keep it nice and simple. We can go back and refine that later on. Um, And we need some line losses here. Okay, so again, we better uh, figure out roughly how long the, how long the line is. It's going to be tricky because, or it's not tricky. It's just that uh, it's going out to the pipe bridge, so you need to. It's going to be a little bit longer than you. Some of the in process. Okay, so we're going from those diesel feed pumps down into uh, diesel A, diesel B. Okay, so diesel B is the furthest one, which is kind of nice. That makes life a little bit easier. So all we probably need to do is just get a, a line onto the pipe bridge and run it all the way down there. Can I do that? See how we get on, how it goes. Okay, so from roughly about there, and then right down to let's get on the axis. Hold the shift key down. 
looks like there's 550 feet just of straight run on the pipe bridge to get it down to the last tank. 556 maybe. Then we've got a little bit of, depending on where those, we might not want to have this, the storage tanks right against the pipe bridge. They might be fur a little further out because they might be in dikes. So, which we didn't think of when we did the model, but let's, uh, let's give ourselves another. computer isn't like that, does it? Dang. Just get a little bit of a sense of they went out through here a little bit. It was about a hundred feet or so maybe out there. Let's just give ourselves let's just give ourselves a little safety factor for that. And then there would be a, a little bit of messing around uh, back up in here. Whoops. So that was, uh, we just had the straight run of pipe. Let's see here. So in and around the pump discharges here, we're probably going to go up. Red line here. Blue. Can't see colors on here very well. There. Okay, so let's just run a couple little pipes here. Bridge here, come on. That should work. And then from there, red, there we go. Roughly about there, okay. So that'll just give us the rough lengths on the pipe bridge itself to get up onto the pipe bridge. Eight feet there, another three feet there. Eighteen there. That's about thirty, right? And about another ten feet there. So about forty feet. That should be close enough. So we have about seven hundred feet of piping. Now, admittedly, the flow rate the, the flow rate actually changes uh, through this. So, by rights, what we really should do is, if you want to do this rigorously, uh, you'd want to know where the hydrocracker is coming in. You could do the pressure drop calculation with the lower flow, and then once you join the higher flow in here, do the pressure drop calculations with that higher flow. You might even you might actually have changed pipe diameter in here. Actually, you would do it before the split, before the joining. Uh, I think because the flow rates are really not changing that much, the line size probably isn't going to change that much. Um, and we might as well just do, I think I can make a fairly safe simplification and just say that the flow rate uh, from here onwards for the frictional losses is just the combination of those two flow rates of about um, 10 US GPM. Yeah, okay. So we need 700 feet of line that's handling 10 US GPM. I'm going to go back to the wiki. Find out what kind of line size we should be using for 10 US GPM. Okay, so velocity in a two inch line is about one foot per second. We're looking for five to seven feet per second, typically. So. Three quarter inch line is probably a little too small. A one inch line could just about do it probably. Okay, so we could do that with a one inch line. 
And I lost where I was on that table. Maybe a little bit wider here. Right in the middle there. Right there. So 10 US GPM could almost go to three quarter inch line, actually. The problem with really small line sizes running on a pipe bridge is that the line, because it's so small, it's flexible and it bows the whole way through um, the supports on the pipe bridge. So the piping guys will tell you, we don't run anything smaller than a two inch line. Otherwise, it costs more. We have to support it more often. It's just cheaper to run a two inch line. So you're going to get into an argument with the piping guys because they're going to want to run two inch line. And you're going to look at that and go, well, uh, is that an okay velocity for me? Is there going to be um, problems with velocities being too low? It's going to be laminar or, the, or solids would settle out. I think at one foot per second, uh, we get pro we're probably okay with stuff not settling out. It's, it's on the low side. So we've got a tough decision to make here. Do we kind of oversize the line with low velocities and low pressure drops, or do we go with something uh, that we think is probably closer to the right uh, line size? The other thing they can do is they can strap the one inch line to an existing two inch line on the pipe bridge. So if there already is a, one, a, a two inch line there, they can kind of support them off each other. Okay, so I think if it were me, I'd pick the two inch line. But for the sake of making this a more interesting problem, which is a bad idea, I'm kind of uh, curious about what would happen if we did it with a one inch line. So I think I'm going to try and do the calculations with a one inch line and kind of know that um, the pressure drop would probably be less with a two inch line. So let's try the one inch line and, uh, and see where it goes from there. Okay, so that would be roughly three PSI per hundred feet at that flow rate. the crane. Uh, we need to put our uh, factor of four in there for the safety factor. Now, we've, we know we're going to have a, a long straight section in here, so a factor of four might actually be a little bit uh, of too high a safety factor. We might be over, we probably are overestimating the line losses with that kind of a safety factor, just because it's sitting on, it's just running through a pipe bridge. It's not actually really sneaking around very much. We'll leave it on there just as a worst case. So 700. That's 21 times 4. We're talking about 80 PSI with a 1 inch line. Ouch. It's doable. And now I'm really thinking about the 2 inch line. What if I do it as a 2 inch line? Point one oh eight. Makes a big difference. Three PSI. Maybe even less, actually, because of that safety factor being too high. This might be, this might be as low as maybe um, half of that. So maybe 40 PSI if we looked at this, uh, maybe a more rigorous study. So it's starting, I'm starting to think that a more rigorous study would be smart here because there's so much variation in the numbers. Sitting down, uh, actually counting the elbows, and then using something like, uh, what do we have in here? On here is a handy little table of equivalent lengths. So, uh, uh, a long radius elbow here in our size is only worth probably 
uh, two feet of extra piping. Yeah, that factor four is definitely going to be high. So a, a, a much better, uh, this, is, this is where I think I would stop and actually do a, a more rigorous analysis of the, of the frictional losses. It would make sense to do that. So, for now, let's, uh, let's th use the two inch line. Use this. Our engineering, our engineering judgment is saying use this. We know the piping guys are gonna say it's cheaper. Um, so, what have I missed? Anything? I think that's pretty much it. So our pump discharge, therefore, is zero PSIG uh, plus the 10.4 for the static head, plus the 10 for the exchanger, plus three, plus our assumed 10 for the control valve, plus uh, three for the piping, And that works out to, what, 2026, 20, basically 36. Gee. Now you gotta be careful because I'm mixing PSIA and PSIG up here. Now, maybe what we want to do is we want to look at the destination, uh, the second destination here. Uh, diesel A, is it diesel B? I think we have the same height probably. They're probably similar tanks, or at least I'm going to make that assumption at this instant. Uh, the line, the diesel A tank was just, um, uh, a little bit further south of the diesel B tank, so the line is a little bit shorter, so we're probably okay just assuming the, the line lengths are the same. We've got a slightly different line length in here, or a slightly different flow rate, but that shouldn't make much difference. Uh, I don't think the density, oh, wait a minute, is the density changing? It might actually. That might actually make a difference. Seven fifty-five. Okay, so yeah, it's a slightly different specific gravity. So let's do it. Uh, let's do it up. Thirty feet times zero point four three three five two times zero point seven five five. Plus, uh, we still have the same uh, control valve, or the same heat exchanger. Plus, we've got, we still have that flow element there, plus we have another flow element, so we actually have two flow elements. Uh, we actually have two control valves in series here, but they're not dueling, so we're okay. So I'm gonna give myself uh, 10 pounds across each of, each of the control valves. And the line losses. I think we can probably assume the same line losses since that number is a little on the dodgy side anyway. Okay. So we know which... Uh, so, okay, so this is 9.75. Forty-eight point seven five. Okay. So we know that this one is the one that's dictating the uh, the pressure drop. Oh, that's going to be a problem. Oh, look at that. Okay. So that means we need to set this at forty-eight point seven five psig. 
And if we were trying to make both of those at the same time, we would end up basically with a higher pressure here trying to fill the tank uh, versus uh, this, which is basically forcing fluid back through into that tank. So that's really telling us that we should be moving that control valve right there. That's a pretty clear indicator in my mind that we've got the wrong control scheme here. So that's good to know. That's good to know. Let's do it. You could put a flow orifice in, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you could think about doing that. Yeah, you could think about doing it that way. I'm going to do it this way, though. It's a little bit more assured. OK, so that changes our, our calculation. It doesn't really change our calculations for the diesel B. Uh, all that stays the same. I've just moved the location of the control valve. Um, and all it really does is it changes uh, that pressure drop there and that pressure drop there. And we recalculate that. Piece of cake. Thirty-five point seven five. Okay, so now it looks like this one is the one that dictates the, uh, discharge pressure on the pump, and so us. Uh, so that means that this needs to be thirty-six point four psi g. And I'm going to convert it to PSIA just because that one is in PSIA. You could do it either way. There. Now I can do a differential pressure across the pump. Okay, so we've got 51.1 PSIA versus 50.45. We can only have one pump discharge. So in order for the system to actually work, what we need to do is we need to equalize the pressures on the, on the worst case. So where we've got a little bit of latitude is right here in this control valve here. So what happens is we need to basically increase that by the difference. So 51. So we need to increase that by 0.65 of a PSI. So we can um, so we recalculated the, the pressure drop of that control valve at 10.65 instead of 10. So that's, um, that's essentially how you do that. If we, had a more, if we use one of the more complicated methods for doing the control valve calculations, then we would still do exactly the same thing where you calculate both control valves, find the one that, find the dominant, the worst case for the pump discharge, and then go back and recalculate the other control valve pressure drop. Okay, now we've got, so moving on basically to step five, and we're really flying now. Um, pump discharge pressure. Is 51.1. Um, Minus 26.98. Okay. And we need to convert that into TDH, total dynamic head. 
So we need to convert that PSI into feet of liquid. And what's kind of weird here, right, is, is our density has changed through here. So we got a specific gravity of 0.8 here, where we had a specific gravity of, what was it, uh, 0.6 here. So which specific gravity should we use to calculate the differential pressure through the pump? Any ideas? Too early in the morning for you guys? OK. Geometric average? Average, av numerical average? Molecular average? What kind of average? My usual joke about averages. <laughs> no, it's not the average. What do you think? We got to buy a pump that's spinning an impeller. Take the heavier one. Take the heavy one, the worst case. Yeah. Okay. Who votes for the heavier one? One, two, three. <laughs> You're not going to vote. Who wants to vote for the light one? Mm, one, two, and the rest of you are asleep. Okay. <laughs> what you want to do is, is it's the pump, it's the fluid that the pump is pumping. Um, so whatever the fluid is pumping, that's the specific gravity you want to use. So let's calculate the TDH. 24, 0.8, 24. Divide it by 0 0.43352 times specific gravity, which is 0.6. And that works out to being 92.7 feet of fluid. OK, that's good. We can also work out the uh, hydraulic and the pump horsepower. Hydraulic horsepower is equal to uh, the delta P, which is 24.12 times, OK, what flow rate should we use? We need to know the flow rate uh, for calculating the horsepower. Do we use 10 gallons a minute? Or do we use, what have we said, 8.47 8 US GPM? That one or that one for the pump horsepower? Which one? 8.47. The 8.47? Yes. You use the 8.47 because it's the fluid that's going through the pump. So 8.47 divided by uh, our magic conversion factor of 1714. So the hydraulic horsepower is 0 0.1 horsepower. <laughs> Hard to believe it could be that small, actually. OK. And then the brake horsepower, which includes the uh, hydraulic, uh, hydraulic efficiency and the motor efficiency, um, is essentially the hydraulic horsepower uh, over, we don't know what the efficiency is at this point in time, so let's just assume it's 50%. Um, it might actually be less than that, because we're probably going to be far to the left of the curve. Um, 50% efficiency. Did I actually do that calculation right? I did. So about a quarter of a horsepower. Ouch. That is going to be hard to find a pump that small. But that's what the numbers say. So now we got to go shop. Now we got to go shopping. Let's see what we can find online. Here's the Gould's pump sizing selector. We need to put 8.5 US GPM through it. 
our TDH is 92.7 feet. Our suction pressure, we don't actually really need to enter it, but we could if we wanted to. So that's 26.98. What do we want that in? PSI G? Twelve point three, and we are running a hydrocarbon. Now it's possible, even though you're normally going to run a hydrocarbon through this system, you might actually start the whole system <coughs> up on. You might start the whole system up on water, just to make sure it's all working and leak tight. And so there's a possibility you would at one point in the life of this process, want to run that pump on water. So there's a chance um, that you might want to check what your pumps can do uh, with water, but we are going to use 0.6 for now, our specific gravity. We don't know what our NPSH is and our viscosity. Our viscosity was, what did we say? It was low, right? 0.6, I think I remember. Uh, through the pump, it was low. 10. Temperature, we'll just leave that off for now. Okay, so let's pick a couple of pumps here. Let's give ourselves, let's start with an 1800 RPM and a 3196 uh, pump, like I suggested. There we go. Let's see if I click the right button here. Okay, well, right away. It's got a pump selection for us. There's only one. <laughs> We're not a lot of choice. Here it is right here. Let's have a look at it. There it is there. And ouch, are we ever low efficiency? We're actually, uh, I think it said it was, if you go back to the results there, uh, the efficiency is actually 10% efficiency. So therein lies the problems of trying to use rules of thumbs for efficiency. Um, we're actually, that red line that, that's showing up there, that's, that's the manufacturer telling you you really don't want to go below that flow rate. Um, so this is one of those situations that I talked about in class where really uh, we should probably be putting more flow back through the minimum, minimum flow bypass um, here. Ideally, you want to pick a pump that's close to the best efficiency point, so, um, you know, somewhere in there. Well, I guess, I guess ideally you'd want to be right there. <laughs> um, so what we could do is we could artificially push the minimum flow bypass uh, up in terms of flow rate, just get the pump out, uh, out here somewhere, but we're going to go from using 10 gallons a minute up to something like 40, 50, or 60 gallons a minute. For now, I think I'll just leave it the way it is. I'm going to think about it a little harder. But I'm going to leave it for now until I come up with a better solution. The only other thing left to do would be the NPSH calculations. Okay, so I, I just I did make a little bit of a mistake here. I got I got a little jumpy on my addition of, of my flow rates here, and I uh, when I calculated the flow rate through this system, I added the 8.47 US GPM here to the 1.4 uh, rated coming from the hydrocracker, and that gave me 9.91 US GPM. Can anybody see the mistake I made there? Uh, what are, okay, so that's 6 US GPM times the 1.2 divided by, what's this? No, it's for the minimum flow bypass. So I actually added the minimum flow bypass into here, which is not the right number. So minimum flow bypass is coming back through here. So, so this should actually be 6 times 1.2, which is 7.2 coming through here, add that to the 1.4, 
And so that goes to, what did we just say, 8 point, whatever it is, 8.6. So I screwed that up. That's hard to do this stuff without making a mistake, especially when you're old like me. Um, okay, so now the pump flow rate is still is still correct though because we're just we're, you want the minimum flow bypass to be included in the in the pump flow rate, so there's no no problem there. I just so our our pressure drop will be a little bit off there. Um, I'm off by about 10 percent roughly, 12 percent something like that, on my. Uh, on my frictional losses, but I, I don't think that's going to make very much difference to the rest of the calculation, so I'm not going to go back and, and redo the rest of the calculations. But I did, I did, the other thing I, I just wanted to kind of hone in on, though, is uh, this one. This is, I, I don't think I've done one of these 470 problems where the numbers have had so much range in, with the assumptions that I've used. And so I'm not happy about that, and I would like to go back and, and do that. I'll go back and do that myself at my desk, just do a little bit more accurate. But I, I, uh, one thing we, we did here is we assume that the crane tables are correct. And so uh, the crane table is using um, water. And when we looked at when we looked at using the crane table here, the specific gravity was uh, less than water. The viscosity was less than water, so we're probably uh, good for basically overestimating the pressure drop through here using the crane table. But let's just check the viscosity after we go through that cooler, because we cool that, that, gap, that oil down a little bit. And we'd be smart just to check our numbers rather than make grandiose assumptions. And so here we are. Where is the viscosity? Oh, there it is there. So the viscosity is 4.1 centipoise, about four times what the, uh, what the crane table probably would have assumed. So we would expect our pressure drops to be a little bit underestimated using the crane table numbers. So there's another um, problem with, with that might not be a bad idea to actually go into HISIS or some other pipe pressure drop program, uh, set up a pipe segment, and give it a try maybe. So let's see here, connections. Oh, we got that. That one's the cold diesel. Okay, yeah, I set the. So I'm going to define that stream as the cold diesel stream. And just check that. Uh, viscosity is down at the bottom there. Okay, so there's my four centipoids viscosity. And um, assuming that it's a one inch uh, pipe, it has a 0.97 inch uh, ID. And where I got that from, I think it's on the wiki, but also I, uh, I went into my handy crane table here. And in the crane table on page B16, looks like that. You can go down the standard pipe sizes. There's the one inch pipe. Uh, it says the OD is 1.315 inches. And for schedule 40, schedule 80, for schedule 80, it's 0.957 inches. So if it's that small, it's probably uh, schedule 80, so let's make that. Okay, and then we want to just have a look at what we did here for the segment. Uh, I made the length 100 feet, elevation change of zero, and somewhere in here you can put fittings and things like that in there if you want, but I just set up, just give me a straight 100 feet of pipe here. And it's telling me that I have a pressure drop, uh, whatever the difference is there. And so 1.8 PSI per 100 feet in one inch line. So that was that number 
right there. If we go to two inch line, let's just try it with two inch line. So two inch line, that'll be ske uh, standard schedule 40, so that'll be an ID of 2.067 and 2.375. Numbers seem a little weird to me, you guys. 2.3, call it 2.067. if we just actually told us what the pressure drop is. Does it do that? No, of course not. Okay, so now we're down to, wow. .03 PSI per 100 feet. Well, that number's conservative then from the crane table. I always thought, I thought that was going to come out the other way around actually with the higher viscosity. I thought for sure we would end up with a higher pressure drop per 100 feet. I've never used HISIS to size pipes before, so I'm not 100% certain in the correlations or not 100% um, confident in the correlations it's using. I think I want to go <laughs> and, and check that. Um, but my point, there's actually some other pressure drop pro programs that you can use. There's some online. There's some on the wiki you can use. There's a good one that Bob Heaslip wrote. So um, I guess once again, I'm kind of suspicious of this calculation. I want to spend a bit more time doing that. But let's move on to doing the NPSH calculation, which unfortunately the camera is not going to see, but you guys are because we're going to use the other um, whiteboard here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate uh, the difference between the inlet pressure of the pump and the vapor pressure of the fluid. So the vapor pressure of the fluid is pretty easy to get at. All we need to do is go to HISIS and we've got the diesel from the column. Um, actually, it probably right is right at its bubble point, I would think. So if its bubble point is the column pressure, then we know what it is just based on uh, the pressure right at the column. That's a bit of a cheat. I will do it the way I do it normally anyway, but Hopefully, we're going to end up with the same number here. So I'm going to add a stream. I'm going to define it as the diesel from the column. Diesel from column, there it is. OK. And Okay, so right now the pressure is specified at 27.51 psi A. What I need to do is I need to unspec the <coughs> pressure and spec the vapor fraction at the bubble point, which is zero, and 27.51. So that's good. Makes all makes sense. So our NPSH calculation here. That's what Heisen says, but I'm saying that it actually, uh, uh, this, is, this packing is a better calculation of the pressure drop through the tower. So I think it should actually be 25 plus 0.24, so 25.2 PSIA. So I'm overriding what Heisen is saying, and I'm using 25.2 PSIA as the calculated uh, vapor pressure of that fluid. Because I know I'm coming off a tower at the bubble point. So it should be a boiling fluid right at that pressure. 
Anybody see any problems with me making that assumption? Or forever hold your peace. Okay. Um, if I was doing one of the other pumps, I would probably do it just the way I just did it just now. Okay. And uh, now I just need basically the uh, um, oh, I forgot the sign. Okay, so now I just basically need the pressure uh, that's at the uh, uh, pump suction, which is 26.98. So I just want to make that a negative sign and make this a plus sign just to get the uh, 26.98. So that equals... One point seven eight psia, and I just need to convert that into feet of uh, the actual fluid that we're pumping. So, uh, one point seven eight uh, divided by, yeah, divided by zero point four three three five two times specific gravity, which is point six going through the pump. And I come up with 6.8 feet. And PSH uh, available. Now, actually, here's where we want to check our Goulds because we want to know how many uh, feet of OK. so. Uh, Gould say we need 2.2 2 feet of NPSH required. And since we have 6.8 uh, available and 2 required, the difference there is roughly uh, uh, 5 which is greater than three feet, therefore we're good. The pump we selected is, is good to go. And uh, if we looked out on the pump curve here, if we start to move uh, out on the pump curve, there's the NPSH uh, right there, two feet, three feet. Uh, we could move a long ways out on that pump curve before we'd ever start to have NPSH problems. So that's a good sign happy with that pump selection and I wouldn't feel too badly about maybe maybe moving our minimum flood by bypass up so we could move out on the on the pump curve a bit. So other than showing you the control valve sizing uh, program, do you want me to do that or you guys want to blow it off? You want to see the control valve sizing? Okay, it's pretty quick hopefully. Hopefully it won't crash on me. Let's just see what we come up with for this. It may not be totally applicable to our, uh, our situation, but let's see what we've got here. Okay, so we have uh, roughly uh, 8.47. Okay, so I'm going to put my... Uh, I'm going to put my normal flow in as eight and a half through the uh, through the pump, so that's that flow right there. That includes the minimum flow bypass. Uh, my pump suction pressure is uh, oh wait a second. the other flow rates. I'm going to assume that I want to go to half flow rate. That's just a number I picked, and I'm going to assume that I want to go basically to 20 percent higher in terms of flow rate as well. So maybe actually maybe what we should do is just put that in a six. And then we've got the 7.2 calculated for us. So let's do it that way. OK, the pump suction pressure is 26.98 PSIA. Uh, minus 14.7. OK, 
Okay. Uh, our specific gravity was 0.6. Like that. Our destination pressure was zero. Uh, our static head to destination was about 30 feet, we said. Our frictional losses, what are we have in frictional losses? 10, 13. Wait a second, what have I got here? Our marker go. Um, that's the static head there, right? Uh, oh, let's just do it here. Okay, so we've got 10, 13, that's about it, really. Uh, oh, plus the line losses, which we said was another three. Okay, so we've got 16 PSI in frictional losses. I'm going to pick a pump rotational speed of 1800. And. Now, basically, the program does everything else for you. You can't see the colors on here very well. Um, that, what that looks like green is actually yellow to me. Uh, so Connell's method is saying we should have about 15 pounds across the control valve. Right now, um, this is converged on having a, a, a max to minimum ratio of control valve CVs of four. We want to make that 10. So we very quickly uh, go up and do a what if. Go seek that. Whoops. Hold on, Dave. My mouse here. Uh, go seek that value by changing the control valve DP. We're done. So my method says we should have about uh, 18, 19 psi across that control valve. Uh, the problem with using this method is that it assumes that that flow rate is at the best efficiency point of the, cur of the pump curve and that this moves up the pump curve and this moves down the pump curve as you go out in flow rate. And we now know, because we've already selected the pump, that we're a long ways away from that best efficiency point. So the assumption of the pump curve uh, slope using this um, spreadsheet is essentially completely wrong. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the only other way to do that is da, 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 da. there is actually not on this spreadsheet, but another spreadsheet you can actually put in the um, uh, you can actually put the pump curve data in there and calculate it. But anyway, so. Our assumption around 10 psi is probably not too far off. It's, there's, there's nothing really here to say that we're, we're, uh, we're in trouble. We could have made that maybe 15 psi. Connell's saying 15.7 psi. So uh, maybe we want to boost that up in terms of a little bit of pressure. But I think we're, uh, we're in the right ballpark, getting the right pump here. So our costs for the pump are going to be bang on. No question about that. Um, I think if you can use this spreadsheet, I think it's probably a pretty good idea to do it that way. So it's quick and, f and fast to do it. So I should have I popped this up when we were back doing the control valve because that's, that's normally when you do it. You do it before you've selected the pump. That's, that's the point of this is to try and select the control valve and the pump all at the same time um, in a sort of optimal, get you very close to the optimal pump and control valve pressure drops uh, right off the bat. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is let's have a look. The, the CVs are 0.5 and 4.6 on that. Maybe just scroll down here a little bit. It's a little bit hard, but 0.5 and 4.6. So this valve, this valve table of CVs, I know you guys can't see this. You know, I can zoom it up a little bit. Is that almost legible? No, let's keep going a little bigger. There. Okay, so 0.5 to 4. Well, 0.5 is right off the table. So a one inch uh, valve is too big for that, uh, no matter what, if we want to turn down to 50% of flow rate. Uh, and 4 is still only about 45% open. So it's clear that we really need to be using like a half inch uh, valve in that application. 
maybe a three quarter inch valve. So that's just interest, that's just for interest. So we know that no matter what, we're gonna end up having some reducers around that uh, control valve. And that's pretty much it, unless you guys have any questions. Nothing more, really more for me to say. It's, it's at, this has been a really interesting problem because it's really hit us uh, in some unexpected um, areas. And I guess that's, that's why you're engineers because you come across some of these things and you realize that the rules of thumb really shouldn't be applying. And you've got to spend a little bit more time just pinning down the calculations in some of these areas. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's been a good one. I like it. Thank you very much for coming by this morning, you guys. <laughs>